Rosillo and Canal podcast. Welcome back to Rosillo and Canal. Will Kane in for Ryan Rosillo. If you've missed any of the first couple hours, you can watch all three hours of the show on ESPN News. You can check out our podcast. You can listen to us on uh, the app on ESPN, on your ESPN app. Many ways you can listen to us and get Will Kane's just piping hot takes. So that's actually fun. I think you've been good. Oh, geez, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's been fun, man. It's been a fun couple hours. And uh, I think it's only going to get hotter in here as we go. I don't know if you noticed I did a wardrobe change because it literally was hot in here. I have a gray shirt on, mm. and I'm a sweater. Like So when I sweat, it shows through. I noticed so I that. Did. You were pitting them in to go. Is yeah, that why you so, were covering it up? Uh, yeah, absolutely. I am just a sweater. Like It doesn't matter if it's 60 degrees. I have to. You're wearing a gray shirt. That's true. Yeah, it's not the, the worst for Shona. It's yeah. about to get much hotter in here, though, because uh, we have Stephen A. Smith that's going to join us here in a second. But Stephen A., All I right. want you to listen to some sound that we have from Draymond Green. He was on with the Uninterrupted and talked about people hating on Steph Curry. Here's what he had to say. Okay. I think most people look at it like, oh, man, this was a, in quotes, privileged kid growing up. Like, he ain't supposed to become this. He's supposed to be the guy from the hood that never had nothing and had to grind for everything. But when you look at Steph's life, like, they were, they had money, but Steph wasn't treated like they had money, you know? They didn't raise them like they were just these privileged kids. People just all automatically think that, man, this guy ain't from the hood. Like, he ain't cut like that. He ain't cut from a different cloth. Like, he supposed to be soft and this that and of course Steph light skin so they want to make him out to be man, soft. people be sleeping on the light skin angle yeah, man like and so everybody just wanted to make him out to be this soft jump shooting guy and he continued to get better and better and better but the the number one thing whether it's former players whether it's current players all those that do, that hates on Steph, that's jealousy but how, how much of this world is built on jealousy right so <laughs> like, that ain't never changing. They want to see you do extremely good, but they never want to see you do better than them. And he's doing better than a lot of people. So, Stephen A., Draymond Green has his theory on why Steph gets so much hate. Do you buy into it? Well, first of all, I don't think Steph gets that much hate, but I do get where Draymond Green is coming from. Uh, what I think that th- that people need to recognize is that you have a lot of NBA folk that look at Steph Curry, and he's a different kind of superstar. When you see a, a young black man uh, that's a star uh, and, and arguably the face of the NBA, certainly LeBron is, but Steph Curry uh, for the previous two years, especially some would argue that he was, you're talking about a guy that comes from an environment different than the typical NBA star that happens to be African-American. Uh, Steph Curry came from an affluent background. His father was a, a star shooting uh, guard uh, in the NBA in terms of his marksmanship because of that level of affluence and not necessarily growing up in the hood. And instead, you know, familiar with golf courses, familiar with communicating with people outside of impoverished communities and what have you. It's one of those situations where the assimilation process that the typical African-American star uh, may have needed to go through during his time, during the time in his career, is something that Steph Curry wasn't subjected to. As a result, he knows how to communicate, knows how to ingratiate himself with folks, knows how to articulate himself uh, to to the media, uh, to uh, white individuals, as well as various others. And as a result, that comfortability level is there. And I think that you do may you may have some players uh, that may be envious of it, but not in a fashion where they have any animosity uh, for Steph Curry. But I do think they find themselves noticing that the level of scrutiny that they had to experience is not something that he was necessarily subjected to to that level. And that doesn't have them looking at Steph Curry. That has them using Steph Curry as an example to look at the media to look at Joe Public at large out there and to say to themselves, this is what y'all do. This is where y'all find y'all favorites and y'all treat certain people certain ways and y'all treat us differently. Stephen A., all right. That's what Draymond Green was alluding to. Wait, wait, but you, okay, so you've said, Stephen A., that you don't think he actually gets that much hate. Um, Who's this guy? Marcus Thompson, who's writing this book, The Miracle Rise of Steph Curry, says specifically that Mm -hmm. Chris Paul, Russell Westbrook, and LeBron James have, and this this is the word, disdain for Steph. You don't think that's right? I don't think that's right. I can say this. I don't want to call him wrong, but my direct communication with those individuals, they've never expressed any disdain whatsoever 
for Steph Curry. But they can't what because they can't because they. But when you watch in last year's playoffs, when Russell Westbrook and Durant were asked, there was, there was a. There was a disdain. Like you could see it on Russell Westbrook's well, face well, when he's asked to go back and forth between Steph Curry. Well, what and I would ask you, what I would ask you to remember, Danny, is that yeah, I'm on first take, but I've been covering the NBA for over 20 years, and I've got a lot of personal relationships with these guys. And so, a lot of times when I'm talking to them, it is off the record, it is off camera, it is privately. And so, when I make a statement like that, that's where I'm coming from. Now, they may have and harbor hostility or animosity or whatever, but it's again we point to the media and the coverage of a Steph Curry like Max Kellerman this morning uh, will Danny Day he alluded to the level of success Steph Curry has enjoyed well Allen Iverson was a big time figure in the NBA had a profound impact on a generation of players they didn't they didn't envy Allen they revered him why because of the scrutiny that he withstood while going through all of that whether it was self-inflicted or not wasn't the point it's the fact that he had to go through what he had to go through to gain a level of adulation and affection from the public at large and beyond and as and, and and felt the scrutiny of the media as a result those players said That's something that we can relate to because whether it's on a lesser or an increased level, we can relate to that. Whereas with Steph Curry, they didn't feel that's the case. I get that. But look, so here, here, when I told Danny I wanted to get you on, this is where I really wanted to go with you because I know you you can do this. You're willing to do this. I want to have this sensitive conversation. I listened to you and Max this morning on First Take, and I wrote down these things. Okay, Steph's upbringing is different. He had a more privileged upbringing. His rise to fame was faster. I hear you saying he therefore avoided perhaps some scrutiny that a guy like Allen Iverson had. His style of play. Max talked about his style of play is different. So I wrote all these down. But in that interview with Draymond we just played, you hear the interviewer say, people sleep on the light skin, right? Yep. And that's what I want to get with you. Tell me about this. What is this about... Steph's skin color impacting how he's received by other players. The belief emanating from a lot of folks within the African-American community is that the darker you are, the less receptive or a better way to put it, the harder you have to work to gain the acceptance and adulation from folks outside of the black community. And that takes us to, you know, hit from a historical perspective back to the days of slavery and and what followed and what have you, how those who were of a darker hue had it tougher than those who were of a lighter hue. And then you take into account, of course, we just mentioned background and things of that nature. But when they said that you're sleeping on a light skin element, in other words, if you, you know, some people use the term red bone, they say that, you know, you're a light skin, you're a red bone or whatever the case may be, because you're of a lighter hue, a lighter pigmentation uh, that. That combined, obviously, with your behavior and what have you, lends itself towards you being received and receptive more. Now, you guys can. But is that real, Stephen A. In this respect, is it? I know it's it's a real real, feeling. No, I know it's It's real, real and I know the historical background that you're talking about there and why that can be. But is it real that it would manifest itself in the way that? And I don't. I don't want to point to any one particular player, but one player would treat Steph differently. Because he's light skinned, in other words, he'd be he'd be rougher on Steph because of but that. That's fact. where I'm going. That's where I want you to understand you and Danny to understand where I'm going. I don't think the players would treat Steph rough because of that. I think they would be envious of Steph to some degree. But their real rough treatment comes towards people in the media, whether it's me, you or anybody else, because they feel that Steph is getting a pass that they wouldn't get. Now, if Steph, who has proven he can flat out ball and has proven that he's a relatively nice guy, it's hard to hate somebody like Steph or dislike somebody like Steph because he's a special player and he's a special human being. But nothing quells the momentum of 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 hostility, the momentum of negativity they may feel towards us and people in the public who judge him differently than they would judge the typical African-American athlete who has to, in their mind, go through more so than Steph Curry had to go through. And sometimes it comes across as if there's this resentment towards Steph Curry when, in fact, it's not towards him. It's towards those who cover him, create narratives about him, disseminate an imagery of him that they wouldn't do for others. That's where the resentment and envy per se comes in the play more so than towards Steph himself. Good Uh, stuff, Stephen A. Appreciate it, man. Thanks, man. Thank you guys. All right. That was Stephen A. Smith joining us live from the Sirius XM studios in Nashville. Will, I made a guarantee. I made a hot take. I went out on the limb and I said, you know what? I said, the Celtics are done. 
I'm a little shook, but I'm going to tell you if I'm standing by my prediction. That's going to come up next on ESPN Radio here on Marcillo and Canel. Yeah! Ride the lightning, baby! That's this song. Ride the lightning. A little Metallica here on a Friday. See, I like Fridays that are fun. This seems like a little like I got to go work out. I got to drive fast home now. Take out some road rage. <laughs> if you ranked your your um, pop cultural trivia knowledge, like music, movies, sports, what's number one for you? None yeah. of them are that high. I'm, I'm not a real good recall guy. Like, I can't recall lines from movies. If you tell them, I'll remember them. This is Rosillo and Canell on ESPN Radio. Will Kane in for uh, Ryan Rosillo today. Um, I don't recall things. Like, I love sports. I've been at a lot of sporting events, but I won't remember. And even my own... Like, have you ever played golf with people and they can remember every shot they hit? Like, oh, I remember the third third hole, that green that was kind of, you know, there was a tough dog leg right, and I hit a seven iron on the – you know, I don't remember after I played the round. Like, I kind of just let stuff go. Right. Are you a good recall guy? Like, can you remember? Yes. You can. <laughs> so you remember lines from movies. You remember names of groups, like, in song titles. Like, if well, I this was what I was saying. name that tune, you'd be Well, this is what right. I was saying. Music is a – music is a – um. what do you – uh, a blank spot. It's a it's a blind spot. Okay. It's a blind spot for me. I, I got movies down. I mean, I can movie quote with you and all that all day long. And sports, clearly I'm a sports expert. So, I mean, <laughs> okay. but Self, music. Self-described. I, I couldn't. <laughs> is there any other way, LeVar? <laughs> no, I mean, LeVar, is there right? any other way? Right. You know more about sports uh, than anyone. That's ever, by the way. Yes. Yeah, of course. Um. <laughs> Yeah, but music, like you could play intro songs and intro songs and intro songs. I don't think I can get a single one. I would get some of them. I, I would definitely recognize them. I should be able to give you the title. I could probably give you like the, the little chorus that goes with them. But hmm. All right, tonight the Celtics take on the Bulls. Game three is at 7 p.m. Eastern on ESPN. This weekend preview is brought to you by Geico. 15 minutes could save you 50% or more on car insurance. Visit us at geico.com or call 1-800-947-AUTO. So when the Celtics go down one nothing. I'm thinking, all right, that was Isaiah Thomas, the tragedy. That was a, a game that was really hard to overcome, right? Game two, I'm watching it, and I'm saying, all right, there still is clearly an emotional hang-up with this team. They're exhausted, totally understandably so. But I also see a team that looks completely overrated as the number one seed. And probably the more surprising thing is that with the eighth seed in the Chicago Bulls, they're playing out of their minds because I don't. I mean, I was looking at them watching their race with the Heat to try to get the eight seed, and I'm thinking, man, the Heat might steal this from them, a team that underachieved all year, couldn't find any chemistry. But then you get Rondo going back to Boston. He has this incredible game where he kind of takes over in his old stomping grounds. And after I saw it go two nothing, I'm like, you know what? Chicago just looks like, looks like the better team. I don't think Boston has a chance to win this series. I think they'll sneak a game out. Maybe two. I think it could go six. But I think Chicago is going to advance in this series. And then we come in today, and you get the news that Rajon Rondo is out indefinitely with a broken thumb. And, yeah, it makes me nervous. But I think with a two-game lead going home, I still think the Bulls are going to move on in advance, upsetting the number one seed. Well, even without the Bulls losing Rondo, I think you were probably overvaluing two games. Now, Boston got completely and utterly outplayed in those two games. And Ryan Russillo, who um, knows a world of basketball, would probably say these problems for Boston were evident before the playoffs started. They can't rebound. They can't defend that well. Um, or they have holes on defense. No one was and confusing that, the Celtics for the best team. In right. The, but I think a lot of people, myself included, said, hey, maybe this is the team that will give the Cavs the best shot. It's yeah, because you know what? yourself when you've seen these two games. But I thought, like, I was like, yeah, this team, when they play inspired, you know, they look pretty good. But but you know what? That's because they're better than these last two games. Whatever you saw in the last two games, that's really not the Celtics that were all season. Yeah, they may have had some of these problems rebounding all season, but they're better than this. And clearly, Isaiah Thomas's sister's death is hanging over him and that team by extension. And on the other hand, the Bulls aren't this good. They didn't play this good all, all season long, the Bulls. And so... You got to figure that both of them would become their true self before this series is over. Doesn't mean Boston's going to be able to come back completely. Who do you have? Who's advancing right now? Yeah, right now. Like sticking. Are you? Are you? Who is advancing to round two? The Bulls or the Celtics? Right now. What do you want me to ask you after? You I think I'm going to take the Celtics. I'm going to take the Celtics. You are. You're saying they overcome. I'm the a huge believer in Isaiah. 
I think Isaiah is really good. I loved I, watching him play. I love what I, but that's the thing. I don't know if it's enough. Like I'm betting on Isaiah, and there's a lot hanging over him right now. There is. Hey, let me ask you this: the Celtics. I, I'm fascinated by this. I, do we have time? Or you got to move on to something else. No, I was going to do some more QBs and ask cars. But no, no let me ask you going. this real quick. I love watching this with the Celtics. The Celtics team is is really fun team. They've got like four guys who you'd say those are glue guys and championship teams need those. Marcus Smart. Um, when he's not flipping off the crowd. Jay Crowder, <laughs> Avery Bradley, role Rozier. Players. You're saying role players. But good, like right. high quality. He's a vet now Horford, like a guy who's out there going to bring some, some experience, leadership. All so those guys are great four or five guys You know, yeah. on your pecking order. They're not number two guys. They don't have a number two guy to Isaiah. So here you are. Once the season's over, they got, let's say the lottery plays out the way it is. They got the number one pick. I don't see a fix for the Celtics. This is an amazing loaded draft. But what do they do? Because it doesn't actually make sense for them, this draft. A point guard. They're I all totally point agree. guards. Right. I, and I don't. this is the problem I have with Danny Ainge holding on to those picks when you could have moved it when the Cavs looked vulnerable coming into the season. Why didn't you try to do something to bolster your roster, which everyone knows is Isaiah Thomas and a bunch of role players? Why didn't you try to make a move? And I, I get the conversation of, well, maybe Jimmy Butler wasn't really available. I right. get that. If that's the case, then I totally get it. But – is there a Paul Joy? Could Paul George clearly wanted out? Could you have done? I, I, there is a time when I feel like it's okay to overpay. Like when the Vikings went and traded for Sam Bradford, everybody was like, oh my gosh, they're giving up way too much. I'm like, you know what? That is a playoff caliber roster. Totally cool with that. Go ahead. Overpay for it. And I feel but, like the Celtics are a team where if you had to overpay, that would have, that would have been the worst thing in the world where now you're going to get bounced. And you, you, like you just said, if you get a top pick and you get one of those players – it's just going to be in the same cycle But as that's always. not over. So, okay, they get a top pick. They could still trade that pick for Jimmy Butler or Paul George this offseason. And now here's the question. Would you do that versus taking Markel Fultz from Washington or Lonzo Ball from UCLA, who basically displace Isaiah Thomas? You cannot – I don't know how you play Isaiah Thomas – and one of those two guys. They're all ball-in-your-hands guys. Agreed. Here's why I would take them, because I cannot stand – the unknown of those two. They look great in college. Lonzo Ball's great. You know, pick your guy in college, wherever it is. There is not a surefire. And even Ben Simmons, who's hurt. Like, you still don't know with him, but he looked like the closest thing. Or an Andrew Wiggins, like guys that are clear-cut number ones. With all these guys, that unknown, I don't know if they're going to be as good as Jimmy Butler or Paul George. So I would absolutely be looking to trade those to get somebody. I know exactly what I'm getting. I'm getting an all-star, a guy who can instantly make us able to challenge an eight seed. <laughs> like that's it's not asking that much. And then if you get that much better, maybe you can challenge Cleveland. Yeah, I feel like Boston has a choice. Their choice is basically Isaiah Thomas or Markel Fultz. Do and you, I would pick Isaiah Thomas and either do what you're saying, trade the pick for Jimmy Butler or Paul George, or honestly, Josh Jackson from Kansas has to be considered. He's great, but they need rebounding and scoring. Markel Fultz and Lonzo Ball only add to the scoring side and actually take some away because Isaiah Thomas has the ball less. Do you know who Cyril Grayson is? No. I didn't either until yesterday. But he's got an amazing story. We're going to get him on. You're going to want to hear it. He ran track at LSU, and, oh, by the way, he signed with an NFL team last week. We're going to talk to him next on Marcelo and Canell on ESPN Radio. Okay, Kevin, for the grand prize of $1 million, what color is the White House? Um, I know this. I know this. I know this. Um, five seconds. Oh, Switching to Geico could save you a bunch of money on car insurance? Okay. Judges? That's true, Kevin. Bill and Owen, congratulations. You're a winner. Woo! Geico, because saving 15% or more on car insurance is always a great answer. Welcome back to Rosillo and Cannell on ESPN Radio. All of our guests on Rosillo and Cannell appear via the Shell Pennzoil performance line, like our next guest. Uh, that, of course, was number one spot by Ludacris. That was uh, requested by Just Rich. I'm still a little bummed out that Freeze Pops hasn't given my request that I emailed him over two hours ago. Still haven't heard it. Best for last. But, all right, there we go. Best for last. Um, but our next guest is somebody very intriguing to me because I think it's a great story. And if you know, if you're mildly familiar with the NFL, you might have read it. But Cyril Grayson was a track star at LSU, an All-American track athlete there, and wanted to all of a sudden transition and say, hey, I played football in high school. I want to make this transition and give it a shot. So, Cyril, what's going on, man? How are you? Nothing much. How's it going? I'm just finished working out. Um, I'm doing pretty good. How are y'all? We're fantastic, man. So, take me, walk me through this. So, you finish your four years of eligibility at LSU as a track athlete, 
And then what happens next? Like, how do you all of a sudden go from four years of track to signed by the Seattle Seahawks to play in the NFL? What happens between there? Um, so in between that transition period, you know, I already had my mindset that I wanted to play football and I wanted to play in college first. That would have been the best way to go about it if I could have went about it that way. But because of the compliance rules and different eligibility issues that took place, I wasn't able to do so. So I set out my last year, went to school and did what I need to do. And I kind of trained on my own a bit. And then as pro day and all these things were approaching, I started to train harder for, you know, specific drills that I know I needed to do. And I also ran a bunch of routes and did a lot of things like that. And it worked out for me. Uh, When I went to pro day, I performed really well. And then I was seen by the Seattle Seahawks and a lot of other teams but the Seattle Seahawks were kind of the first people to give me a shot and what more of a perfect place to be because I'll definitely have my shot to, you know, compete. Wait, Cyril, so how did you get into LSU's Pro Day? Um, I talked to um, the strength and conditioning coach. I talked to him. He told me who I needed to talk to to try to get in. I went and talked to those guys. You know, they kind of and it was, was cool. giving they let me you a in. little brief. Yeah, and then eventually after, you know, talking to him, emailing back and forth, going be a air aggravating bug, you know, they finally let me in. And what'd you run in the forty that day? Um, four thirty three on their tire. So I don't know. That's blazing. So how did you do on the routes? Like how cause you played in high school, right? You played wide receiver in high school, had over seven hundred right. yards receiving, so you're kind of familiar with a route tree, like how to do certain things. But how did you perform there? Like, how awkward was it having not run any routes in four years? Um, if I guess the scouts told me, you know, I looked just as smooth as the other guys who had been running routes and seemed like, you know, I had a little bit of rust, but it's nothing that couldn't be knocked off in a couple of weeks if I get into the right program and I keep practicing. All right, Cyril, you got to help me. Okay, I got to get this straight, okay? Let me get your story straight. This has been done. This has been done. But Bob Hayes was a track star, right? Uh, Marquise Goodwin was a track star from the University of Texas, Buffalo Bills wide receiver. But he played football in college. So you last played in 2011. Have you graduated from LSU? Um, I graduated May 12th. May 12th. Here's what I'm trying to wrap my brain around. Why don't you have to go into the draft? Um, I believe because I've been out of collegiate sports for a year and – I didn't play this last season, so I was kind of deemed a free agent instead of being draft eligible. So one of the advantages that you had, which is great for you, is that you got to choose teams. So how did the Seahawks end up being the team that you signed with? They were the first people who came to talk to me. um, And just knowing Pete Carroll's kind of reputation of playing, you know, who shows, who Gives, he gives everyone an opportunity, and not everybody's like that. A lot of people pay the big dollar man, play, make sure they play and stuff like that. And I know I definitely would have a chance here to show my talent and to get a fair opportunity. So LSU has had a rich tradition, especially recently, of wide receivers that are coming out and just blazing up the NFL. Have you talked to any of them? Have you talked to Odell Beckham? Have you talked to any of Jarvis Landry? Any of these other guys, have you talked to them? I haven't talked to him recently. Um, we we kind of hung out a good bit when I was in college, and we talked a couple times since they've been in the NFL, but nothing nothing recently since I've been signed. What's most intimidating to you about this transition? Like, you go in to your first you know drill of hey seven on seven or a team drill eleven on eleven with the Seahawks. What is most intimidating for you? Just making sure I do the right thing. It's more so like the learning curve of things. Everybody kind of know exactly what to do since they've been in the program already. Just making sure I learn what I need to learn and stay on top of things. It's not, you know, kind of going against any of the other guys. I'm confident in my ability. I'm confident that I'll be able to do the right thing. It's just making sure that I do the little things that's 
necessary to catch the eye of the coach. I don't want to run the wrong route and get sent home for anything dumb like that. I know that I'll do the right things because I kind of pay attention to detail, but it's just, you know, not getting those yet is just because I haven't been on the field, just being confident in myself and confident in what I do. Okay, I got to get this still working through this timeline in my head here, Cyril. So <laughs> I want you to take me back. You're you're in Baton Rouge. You're at this pro day. When is the moment that someone came over to you, like a scout or a Pete Carroll or whoever was there, and you realized, I did just catch somebody eye, somebody's eye, but in a good way? Um, I like to say – so at Pro Day, I think I ran the 40, and then I was kind of walking over to do the 5-10-5 Pro Agility. And they had the Rams coach said, you know, right after this, I need to see you. Um, whenever you get some free time, he was the first guy who said that. I mean, Ed was the first guy to talk to me, period. He talked to me the day before, and, you know, he said, I just want to get first in line. You know, just in case you do anything special, you know, I'm going to make sure everybody else get in line, and I want to be the first guy to reach out to you. So he talked to me, a couple other guys talked to me, and then after we ran routes, everything went, you know, really well. I caught every ball that was thrown to me, ran real good routes. And, you know, Ed told me, came over, so I don't make any plans tomorrow, you know, I'm going to try to get you flown out. And then probably 10 or 15 minutes later, he comes back up to me again and says, look, um, our travel guys is making the pl- travel arrangements, you know, pack a bag tonight and I'll get back with you on what time you're flying out and stuff like that. That's so awesome. It was kind of immediately as the drills were going on, I started to get more and more feedback as we went on because it wasn't like I just ran a 40 and, just blew it away and that was enough you know I kept building on that I ran good routes I caught the ball so you know Ed called up here and then he talked to the coach and he said I mean the coach told him coach Dave you know if he caught the ball and he ran fast I mean I'm gonna give him a shot you know just sign him don't worry about working him out once he gets to Seattle so he signs me and now I have the shot I'm out here right now um, an off-season program, working out with the guys and getting acquainted with them and learning from the older guys, which is really good. You know, they're teaching me the ins and out of, outs of things. So I'm excited to be here in Seattle. That's awesome, awesome man. Good Thanks. luck. Yeah, Cyril, we'll be rooting for you. We'll be watching for you. Seattle Seah- Seahawks fans, I'm sure we'll be too, adding another receiver to their uh, squad. And Cyril Grayson with Seattle Seahawks. Thanks for coming on with us. All right, coming Definitely. up previously. Thank you. You got it. Previously on, on Rosillo and Cannell. We had Jamal Adams in here. You called him out. Like I was like, whoa, did you just go there? I thought you knew ahead of time that he had some work done. That's how we no, say yeah, No, no. <laughs> His I was work shocked. done. Work. Yeah, I mean, he did. <laughs> so we'll let him describe it on our previous line. That's coming up next here on Rosillo and Cannell on ESPN Radio. Welcome back to Rosillo and Cannell. It's TRR, TRL Friday. Freeze Pops finally comes through. He did save the best for last. Was that, that your was request? Mine. Yeah. It was? A little chain smokers and cold play, collab. Yeah. Mm. It's on the workout mix. Got that in the I ran five miles this morning. Yeah? I think that's why I was sweating so much. What are you putting in? Like how, what's your mile average? Not too fast. I'm more I just started. I'm like nine minute miles. I'm gonna get it down to eight. Is that too much to cut off? No. No? No. That you're I, in my range. I, I I I'm blown away by the guys that say, Oh yeah, yeah, I just did a six and a half, seven minute mile. I'm like, I don't even know how you get that. No, I don't know how to do that either. This is Rusillo and Canel. You're listening on ESPN radio. Uh, if you missed any of the show, including Jamal Adams, you can subscribe to our Best of Podcast, available in the Listen tab of the ESPN app. The reason you might want to listen to Jamal Adams is because we talked a little grooming. That's our previously on. Previously on Rosillo and Canel. You got your eyebrows done, didn't you? I did. Going to I your did. beautician. How much is going to your beautician? Man, so, you know, I... Is, man, that, is, that, a, is that a is that a rap thing it's, or do you do no, your eyebrows? No, man. The crazy thing about it, I have rough eyebrows. My eyebrows <laughs> get really rough. Um, so you know, my girlfriend and and my my mom and sister, they they're constantly on me like, oh, fix your eyebrows. Like, make sure you fix your eyebrows. So like, it was like one like maybe 
two months ago, man, I got my, my I did my eyebrows. Like, man, they're I finally too perfect. Got they're just too perfect. Right. So they're I'm just, just like, right. you know, like when I first did it, I'm like, man, I might look like a girl. And then I'm just like, you know what? It looks kind of smooth. And then, you know, I also seen, I seen uh, Tyron. I, I don't want to tell his secret, but Tyron Matthew, he get, he get his done. So I was like, you know what? You know, it might not be bad after all. You know, it's nothing wrong with getting your eyebrows just, you know, fixed, fixed the right way. It's nothing wrong with it. <laughs> He was awesome. Now, I was shocked because after we did the interview, I'm like, oh, you read somewhere, you got his eyebrows whacked, right? Or you read some, you know, like Q&A, fun bit. You didn't, you just pulled it out on him, right? Right there, you just, bang, you saw his eyebrows and were they like. They were too perfect. That was just clear. Yeah, that's but even not, if they are. Mother like, Nature did not, you don't, you don't come out like that. You would be a good combine interviewer. Like, if you're the coach trying to find out from a player and you want to do something to keep him off balance, oh. like that's a pretty good question to come at a guy and be like, hey. But what am what? I going to learn? If, if he's sensitive? I think, no, but I think he handled it perfectly. He did, but, like, why would I? You're right. I think I would be a good combine interviewer, but why, <laughs> but why would I be? I don't understand. No, because that question specifically, like, you would be awful in X's and O's. Like, you're not going to say, hey, what are you doing? Uh, three, <laughs> three, three wide outs to the right, weak side. Slide. But no, I get like, what you're saying. Like, just throw them off base and see how they react. Yeah. That's, see how well, they react. think about all the stupid questions you get out there that are just right. dumb or offensive. I'm good at or, asking yeah, dumb questions. Yeah, no, questions. no, but see, I don't, I think that was the perfect kind of just, like, it's almost like at a party, like, it's a icebreaker. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. and you want to see how do they respond to that. Well, I did wonder. Like, I'm about to call this guy out, right? How's <laughs> and he that's respond? why you love confrontation because <laughs> you just confronted him on his eyebrows on air. Yeah, but I'd seen enough of him today. He was on first day. Oh, so you're already sick air. of him? Is that what you're no, saying? No, I no, no, no. <laughs> that I knew the dude was confident and could joke and could take it. There are if guys. If you hadn't, if he had walked in here and just said, "Nice to meet you guys," and we were bam right on air, would you have asked the same question? I might have still done it. Yeah, I think you would. I'd have too. been a little more nervous. So, but it also had us wondering because we started talking about eyebrows, waxing, tweezing, and also facials. We did an over, yes. under, and properly rated. I don't think you fully got off your chest. What did you Let want me, to talk about facials? So here's the thing. I just think of, I thought of facials as like, I don't know, this is just a beautification process of highly feminine one and dude shouldn't be Why going to get it. Why it be just feminine? That, just whatever. So, and, but my wife got me one. And let me tell you what a facial is. Okay. It is like, it's not like, it is. It's getting every blackhead squeezed out of your face. That's the God's honest truth about what it is. It's a lady just contorting your face in every which way. It's painful. It's painful. It is painful. So I thought it was And it's my squeezing wife all of this out of your face, man, I which is pretty awesome. I didn't picture that. I thought it was a relaxing like massage for your face and neck and like your head area. Like you'll just get a massage and it's your face. So I think fixed, pictured something very like luxurious that you did i get enjoy. a special what's is that not how it usually goes michelle it depends what you're talking about will is called extractions uh -huh. and some facials do not get extractions sometimes you have to ask for those mm. a lot of times like danny suggests it's much more calm a lot of masks but you know what eyes. happens which i think totally <laughs> wrecks the whole experience you break out after them not I all didn't. the time i didn't well obviously not because she did all the work on but you. if i explain to you danny here's what's going to happen right uh, you're going to pay, and you're going to lay down, and we're going to get every blackhead out of your face. <laughs> you wouldn't be interested in that? I don't. Ha I would be like, you know what? I don't have that many where it's <laughs> worth it to me to have that done. I just don't. It wouldn't be that much of a priority. I, I don't have eyebrows that I have to deal with. You know, you're like perfect. I, no, no, I'm not saying that. They actually color in some eyebrows on me. <laughs> when I go on TV, they're like, hey, we might want to make it look like you have eyebrows as opposed to mine, which you can barely show up. Like, I'm not above well, like I'm the, like I'm, I have no problem with dudes getting stuff done. There's clearly a market for the the removal of impurities in <laughs> yes. your face. I don't want to keep yes. saying blackhead because it's yeah, gross. it's kind of nasty. It's yeah, a you gross went there, word. Yeah, you went. There. You, but Saruti, you said there's like something that's, that's selling like hotcakes that yeah goes actually, on your face. I'm actually interested in it. It's it's like a black mask. It's like I, I don't know if it's like a tar thing, but it sticks to your face and it's black. And you just ba don't put on any areas with hair because that would be really bad. But then you just peel it off, and it supposedly peels off all the imperfections on your face. I'm very interested in it. Yes, do it. I want to hear about it. Will you do it and, and tell I'll me let about you it? Know. Yep. <laughs> yeah, we'll let him be the guinea pig. We'll let him do it. We'll go ahead, and uh, we'll get your feedback on that one. Hey, man, it's been a lot of fun. Good to see you again, bud. You too. We'll have to do it again soon. I, uh, I'm exhausted because I've been talking for three hours. Because you've I'm been driving. It made stuff. Danny drive. It's like you have to get in shape for this job. So I have a whole new appreciation for Silo and what he does. Uh, he's Will Kane. I'm Danny Cannell. This has been Rosillo and Cannell.
for the past three hours. Coming up next, Bomani Jones.